All right, so thank you everybody for coming and uh, joining us to hear about regenerative farming at Freedom Food Farm. Uh, Chuck is a farmer there with his partner and we're gonna be hearing about their work. So first we would like to thank our sponsors. These businesses uh, support no the NOFA Summer Conference and make all of our work possible. So we really encourage you to um, shop with them and patronize their businesses and um, let them know how much you appreciate their support of NOFA. Um, as you all know, we are presenting, attending, and hosting this workshop from land that was managed and inhabited before European colonization. So we also just wanna take a minute, um, you can find your location on this map, honor those whose land you now occupy, and I'm gonna paste this land this uh, native land.ca website into the chat you can take a minute and look at your area on this map all right thank you so much for joining us i'll turn things over to chuck all right yeah thanks everybody for uh coming and hope i can give some people a better idea of regenerative farming and how to uh, enact regenerative farming principles on whatever scale you may have um, and yeah, I think it's just uh, it's really important to me and really essential to all of us because I think it's really the only path forward um, to get us uh, through the impending climate crisis. So um, yeah, I think it's really important that uh, we learn as much as we can about how to farm regeneratively, um, both for our own health and to make sure that there is um, a habitable planet for uh, next generations. And so. Without further ado, I will um, share my screen and um, start the PowerPoint. So, all right. Uh, so yeah, everybody see that? Uh, just a thumbs up or a clap, somebody. If, um... <laughs> yep, I can see it. All right. So regenerative farming at Freedom Food Farm. Um, there's my email too at the bottom if anyone has questions or follow-ups um, or ideas or anything. I'm happy to uh, yes, talk to people about um, yeah, just more about this topic. So there's a picture of our farm. Um, this is actually a grain crop um, in the front and I'll talk a little bit more too about um, mixing different types of crops on the farm. Um, so our farm is 90 acres in Raynham, Mass. That's about 30 miles south of Boston. Uh, most people aren't familiar with the town of Raynham. It's not typically agricultural land. Uh, we're really one of um, two farms left in the town. Uh, and originally, this is a uh, Narragansett land um, that we're on right now. Our vegetable production, uh, we're doing about four, four and a half acres this year. Uh, we have five um, 3,000 square foot greenhouses. We do wheat, rye, triticale, uh, corn, and oats for grain. We do cows, pigs, chickens, and sheep, and actually a few turkeys and guinea hens for livestock. Uh, we do some value-added products. Uh, we have a Windsor loamy sand uh, here at the farm, which is a lot sandier either. You know, they say sandy loam is, you know, the ideal soil type for vegetable farming, and this is even sandier than that. So it does present some challenges Sorry, as far as water retention um, and nutrient retention. Um, so those are things we have to, we have particular troubles with, um, but we don't have as much of the um, issues with uh, like compaction and uh, losing soil structure through tillage. Although we do try to reduce or eliminate tillage as much as possible. Uh, so we farm year round and you know, our goal is to be feeding people year round uh, and we feed, uh, distribute our food through a farm stand, a CSA, um, two winter farmers markets and one summer farmers market. Um, and to staff the farm, we have five people who are full-time year round, and then two more people who are kind of part-time or seasonal um, doing sales, uh, sales or helping out in the field or doing um, administration and uh, communication and those sorts of things. Um, and we are at year eight in our current farm location uh, and it's the 10th year in business. We were, uh, the first two years of the farm, we were in Johnston, Rhode Island. Uh, so picture of the farm crew, 2019. Um, 
some happy folks there. That's also a big part of the farm. It's not just about the land and the products. It's really about the people um, that makes it uh, makes it a farm. So, um, so what is regenerative farming? Uh, and so I had to steal a definition for this because there are people who um, have much more time and resources to um, put together a cohesive definition uh, and concise definition of regenerative farming. So this is from the Carbon Underground and Regenerative Agriculture Initiative. Uh, I promise this is the only slide with this much text, but I will read it. Um, so regenerative agriculture describes farming and grazing practices that um, among other benefits, uh, reverses um, climate change by rebuilding soil organic matter and restoring degraded soil biodiversity resulting in both carbon drawdown and improving the water cycle. Specifically, regenerative agriculture is a holistic land management practice that leverages the power of photosynthesis and plants to close the carbon cycle and build soil health, crop resilience, and nutrient density. Regenerative agriculture improves soil health primarily through practices that increase soil organic matter. This not only aids in increasing soil biota diversity and health, but increases biodiversity both above and below the soil surface while increasing both water holding capacity and sequestering carbon at greater depths, thus drawing down climate damaging levels of atmospheric CO2 and improving soil structures to reverse civilization threatening human caused soil loss. Um, so as you can see, it's kind of, it's all intertwined really. Um, not only are is regenerative agriculture a process that you know is really the, going to be the only way to grow food going forth as the climate crisis becomes uh, greater and greater and more of a, an issue and we have more droughts and more extreme weather events, but by farming regeneratively, you're also going to be mitigating the climate crisis by sequestering carbon, taking it out of the um, air and putting it back into the soil. So um, you know it's really both the 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 solution um, on, on two levels is the media and the long-term solution to um, the, the climate crisis. So, um, all right, so what are some of the regenerative farming practices um, that we can, you know, that's, that's a great definition, but what does that actually mean on the farm level? And what are some of the things that we can do? So um, they break it down to kind of four main points um, to regenerative uh, farming practices. So the four principles are uh, one, generating and building soils and soil fertility and health. So this picture uh, on the screen now is a, a piece from our, com uh, actually that's from our greenhouse. Uh, we pulled up, I pulled up an old um, plant root, you know, just some crop residue uh, in our no-till system. And you can really see how alive that soil is. There's a lot of uh, mycelium growing on those plant roots, starting to break it down. Um, there's lots of soil structure. You can see how well that soil is holding together. There's a lot of different components in there. There's um, you know, organic matter. There's things that are partly broken down. There's sand. Um, there, there's all the elements in there. And I'm sure if we had a a uh, closer look in that soil, we'd see a lot more living things um, beyond what we can see in this uh, just, you know, eye level view. Um, you know, you'd see, uh, you know, insects, you'd see more fungi, you'd see a lot of bacteria. Um, there's all sorts of things living in there. And, you know, really the best way to get an idea of what's going on in your soil is, you know, if you pick up a clump of soil and you look at it, and if you can see some living things just you know, from uh, you know, just with your eye, your own eyes, without using a microscope, then that's kind of going to give you an idea of how many um, more microorganisms are living in the soil. Um, so if you pick up a handful of soil and you don't see any insects or little things crawling around, then chances are there's not many microorganisms either. So um, that's just a kind of quick way to take a look at it. Uh, Second um, principle is uh, increasing water percolation and retention and reducing runoff. Um, there's a number of ways to do that uh, that we'll go through later, but this picture on the right is from our no-till market garden. And these are carrots that are germinating. And right after seeding, we spread very lightly 
a straw mulch that helps to um, protects the soil surface from the um, raindrops when they come down. They can be very destructive to the soil by uh, breaking down the aggregates that are on the surface. And also, um, you know, so by protecting that soil, you're going to be able to increase the water retention so that you're not forming a hard crust on top of the soil surface and that which the water will run off during precipitation events. Uh, and also you're keeping water from evaporating up out of the soil on a hot, dry day by having some sort of cover on the soil and keeping the sun's rays off the surface of the soil. Um, so that's just a couple uh, notes on some ways to do that. Um, right, and then increasing biodiversity and ecosystem resiliency. It's, you know, they're pretty much hand in hand. So by increasing biodiversity, you're increasing resiliency. You know, they talk about the, fo the soil food web. Uh, it used to be the food um, pyramid, I believe, when I was uh, in high school. And then by the time I got to college, it was the food web. And then we really started to understand that it's not just a linear um, or even, you know, linear system of thinking in the food um, system and the ecosystem. It's more, it's a very broad, very, uh, intricate system interwoven um, where some species, if they're lacking or if they, um, God forbid, go extinct um, or just aren't doing well at a certain year, there are other species that can come in and fill those roles. And so the more biodiversity and the more species, uh, the more groups of um, plants and animals and microorganisms you have on the farm, the more resilient your system is. Uh, you know, it's like a, you can think of a tapestry and if it's, um, you know, there's only four or five threads in there, then there's a lot of gaps in between and things can fall through the cracks. But the more threads you have in your tapestry, um, the stronger it is, the more able it is, it is to catch things and, uh, and keep things from falling through the cracks. Um, and that picture is our, there's a cover crop in the background, there's a permanent pasture in the front, and then we also have animals in there, uh, our cows grazing on the cover crop. and all uh, just as important, if not even more important, um, that sometimes isn't thought about when we're talking about agriculture is the trees and the forests and the um, like riparian zones and um, hedgerows that really are an intricate part of the farm ecosystem. They're not um, just something uh, that's, you know, blocking your sun or your your wind or, um, you know, in the way and keeping you from expanding your fields, they're a very uh, important um, part of the agricultural ecosystem. And oftentimes they are not given the respect that they are due. Um, um, oh, that was a little music there. All right, so net carbon sequestration uh, is the fourth principle in regenerative farming. And so that's really about, you know, the overall on your farm, are you burning more carbon than you're putting into the soil? And so that's really, really hard to measure. Um, and I know there's a lot of startups and things like that that are talking about paying farmers for their carbon and this and that. Um, and I think that is a definitely a good step in the, in the right direction, but it's really difficult thing to measure because, um, you know, even if you are able to measure the actual amount of carbon in the soil, where is that carbon coming from? Is it compost that you're trucking in and you're burning fossil fuels by bringing that compost in? Um, how much carbon, is, you know, what's your net carbon going into the soil if you account for the carbon that was burned up bringing carbon sources to your farm? Um, and also, you know, if you are sequestering carbon to your soil, how much um, you know, fuel are you using in tillage practices or how much fuel are you using to bring cover crop seed to your farm? Um, so it's really, there's a lot of things to think about when trying to figure out your net carbon, um, either use or sequestration on a farm. But um, you know, the main point is you really wanna think about all these things, think about the farm system as a whole, try to reduce your inputs as much as possible because most of our inputs in agriculture are um, produced through fossil fuels one way or another. Um, you know, even if you're not using fossil fuel based fertilizers, oftentimes you're, uh, you're trucking in um, inputs and in there, you know, you use fossil fuels to import them there or you're using irrigation that is powered by fossil fuels. Um, 
So it, you really have to try to think about all the aspects on your farm, all your inputs, um, all your exports, and how much carbon is being used, how much is, is going into the soil, and how much is being put into the air. Uh, so you know, we have no answers yet on how to measure those things, but you know, you can get an idea of looking at all your inputs and then also being really good about measuring the uh, carbon in your soil. Uh, and the more often you can measure that carbon and the more types of measures you can get and the more um, places you can measure from on your farm, the better idea you're gonna get of the amount of carbon you're sequestering. All right, so how do we implement these systems on our farm? Uh, which is the question, how, you know, how do you take all these practical, you know, all these um, ideas and uh, principles and how do you actually put them to use on the ground into mitigating climate, uh, the climate crisis and trying to continue to feed people healthy food. Um, so first one, building soils. Uh, so on our farm, we use a number of techniques to build our soils. Um, so number one, I think most important is compost. I, can't stress enough, compost is really, really important uh, for providing fertility. It, um, it, when properly made, it makes your carbon sources a lot more stable and likely to stay in the soil and not get burned up um, when you do do tillage events or um, if you have runoff or if you have issues from precipitation, uh, you know, bare soil and, and soil getting degraded by precipitation. So we try to make, um, Almost pretty much all our compost on farm. This year we've just gotten to the point where we can um, produce all our compost on farm and we don't have to truck any in. So that reduces fossil fuel use. So anytime you can figure out a way to do that, the better. And if you are importing compost or raw materials for your compost, the closer to your farm you can find them, the better. Uh, you know, so that's kind of where you pull in the farmer ingenuity and trying to figure out what sources are available to me for raw materials to make compost. So a lot of our compost comes from, you know, we raise a fair bit of livestock. So we get manure from our own animals. Uh, we get bedding um, from, uh, we cut straw and hay from our farm and that becomes source for a compost. So that's a good point, uh, you know, a good start to having compost that's coming from the farm. Uh, however, we do import some materials or, or have them imported uh, and we try to use just waste materials whenever we can, things that are otherwise going to go into landfill um, or, you know, some place where they're not really being used. So our two main inputs that we're bringing in for the compost are wood chips, which nine times out of ten, they're coming from within a mile of our farm. Uh, every time I hear a wood chipper, uh, in the distance, I get in the car and I drive around the neighborhood until I find the tree company shipping up wood. And I say, hey, can you got, you know, you're looking for a place to drop that off. And uh, eventually after a few years, it paid off. And now we have a, a good quarter acre size pile of wood chips that I have to deal with at some point. Um, but, you know, that's a great carbon source. Otherwise, those lands, the tree people are, are trucking it quite a ways to get rid of it. Um, and oftentimes they're just dumping it in a pile on a lot somewhere and it's just sitting there not really um, being all that useful. So that's a really great source. And, but it's really high in carbon, so you can't make good compost with wood chips alone. You need a nitrogen source to counteract it. And so our nitrogen source that we get off the farm, um, is, you know, the newer on farm is a good nitrogen source, but from off the farm we get uh, spent grain from a local brewery that's about 15 miles away and that's another thing where they normally would be paying to dump it in a landfill um, and so they're happy to drop it off they don't charge us they just drop it off every couple days a dump truck full of spent grain um, and you know there is some fossil fuels associated with dropping that off but uh, I hope um, that it is, uh, it's definitely better than ending up in a landfill and by making compost uh, in a efficient manner, we can turn that into stable carbon, mixing it with the wood chips. Um, and that is a way to uh, add more carbon to our soil. So also, you know, really paying attention to the way you make compost is important too. In the background on the left, you can see up there, 
uh, we got a grant to get a compost turner that's really changed our system and helps get a lot of air in there. Um, you know, there's lots of information on making compost, but I, I do recommend you try to read up as much as you can on compost making because um, it's a science and an art in itself. Um, but it is essential, I think, to regenerative farming. Yeah. Enough about compost. Um, I could go on and on about it. So cover crops are another, I think, a really another great way of getting carbon into your soil and um, increasing the fertility, building your soil. So here is uh, a sorghum Sudan cover crop that we are actually able to, we no-till drill it into our field. So we're not um, tilling to get this cover crop in, which you know, every time you till, you're burning up uh, organic matter, uh, burning soil carbon and reducing your microbial population um, and destroying your soil aggregates, which all degrade soil health and decrease your ability to sequester carbon. So um, if you can get your cover crops in uh, both planted and incorporated with minimal or no tillage, uh, you're doing a lot better. Um, and I like this picture because we pulled the sorghum sedan and we grazed it once and then with cows to about half level and then it grew back. And we always say that sorghum sedan, if you cut it halfway like that and then let it grow back, it really starts to push its roots down and breaks up hard pans and um, helps aerate lower into the soil. And so I pulled this up after the first grazing to take a look at um, you know, how much it was actually doing that. And it seems like it was doing a really great job. These roots are going really, really pretty deep, really strong. Um, and you can imagine how much of that uh, soil is being aerated and um, hard pans being broken up by those roots just penetrating through there. Um, and also, Another thing to think about when you're doing these cover crops, uh, you know, you see some of the, the sorghum sedan, this high biomass uh, on top of the soil. And generally speaking, you can count on having about the same amount of biomass below the soil as above the soil when you're doing cover crops. So that means if you have this five foot tall, huge biomass above the soil, you're hopefully having about that much um, in root mass below the soil. And so when you terminate those cover crops or get rid of them somehow, um, even if you're not tilling it in and you're just leaving it on the surface, you're having that much biomass in the soil. And as those roots die and degrade and are um, eaten by worms and microorganisms, they're hopefully turning into stable carbon sources. So cover crops are really important. Um, there's also, we mix with our sorghum sedan uh, sun hemp for a, a summer cover crop and that's another high biomass high fertility crop it's a legume so you're adding nitrogen as well um, whereas the sorghum sedan doesn't add any nitrogen um, and so that those two together I have some better pictures later on are really great at uh, increasing biomass and then if you can get that incorporated with minimal or no tillage you're really going to increase your soil health and your uh, your carbon in your soil um, the cover crop incorporation using reduced and no-till, touched on that a little bit, um, but here's another method of doing it. Here we have used, um, we had a big crop of triticale and peas that we, um, we turned our pigs onto, and so they ate the triticale and the peas, so that reduced our fossil fuel input by not having to import grain for our animals. They just, um, and also we didn't even have to harvest it ourselves, we just put the cows right, or the pigs right onto the cover crop. And so that saved even having to use the combine to you know, burn fossil fuels to harvest it. They ate the, um, the peas and the triticale and they incorporated a lot of the biomass. And you can see all these little piles um, coming up here. And those are all worm castings and little um, you know, piles of worms. So that means the worms are really liking this because you know, this was a lot of straw on top. The, pigs incorporated it and also their manure allowed the straw to break down faster, adding some nitrogen to the carbon of the straw and the earthworms just loved it. And so they're further mixing that, um, that biomass on the surface into the soil, adding to your carbon, um, your soil carbon and also uh, worm castings are very stable, um, very stable piece of carbon in your soil. So the more worms you have, the more worm castings, um, that's gonna give you a lot more stable uh, carbon in your soil. So, uh, Rotational grazing with ruminants. 
Uh, I'll touch on that a little bit more too when we talk about uh, biodiversity and integrating livestock on the farm, but you know, rotational grazing with ruminants, um, that's really important to building soil health. Uh, even more, I have some charts later that show compared to no-till, it's, it's even better for your soil and sequesters even more carbon than just switching to no-till vegetable production. So uh, I can't stress this enough that rotational grazing with ruminants is, uh, from my research and my own um, observations on the farm, it's the number one way to um, sequester carbon and increase soil health. And so um, I know there's a, you know, there's some argument out there that going vegan is better for the environment. Um, I really don't think that is the answer. I think um, rotational grazing with ruminants is, especially in New England too, where we have a lot of marginal soils, we have a lot of um, hilly areas that aren't really good for um, crop production because you're gonna lose, you're gonna have a lot of soil erosion if you plow um, hilly land. Um, so rotationally grazing ruminants on those hilly and more marginal lands um, are going to be a lot better for soil fertility um, than growing vegetables or um, pulse crops on them. So, all right, uh, and also another one, um, no-till vegetable production. Uh, so here's our no-till market garden where we um, and we do sometimes use a broad fork, but any tillage we do is hand powered. And so that uh, really reduces the impact. And then as much as we can, we're not doing any sort of tillage. We're just using tarps uh, to break down um, old crops or, you know, if we have some weeds there, uh, we're using a lot of mulches. We're using a lot of compost. Um, we're now wood chipping the aisles too. Um, so that's adding a little bit more carbon in there that way. Um, and just really trying to reduce or eliminate tillage whenever possible. Uh, some field, you know, beds like this bed of lettuce will pretty much harvest all of them. You know, maybe when we're done harvesting it, there's like 10 or 15 heads that bolted or weren't any good and we'll just cut them out, feed them to the um, sheep or the, the cows or something and then be able to plant right into that bed without even having to um, cover it with a tarp or um, to broad fork it or, or anything. So just the less you can disturb the soil, the better. Um, so on larger acreages, we are experimenting and having some successes and some failures with uh, mechanized no-till crop production. Um, we do have a limited number of farmers on the farm, so we can't, you know, it's pretty hard to do all four acres and all the livestock and grain. Um, with just the folks we have if we we're doing it all hand powered. So um, in order to make it economically and socially sustainable, we need, you know, at the time until we have this mass movement of farmers back to the land that I'm uh, waiting for that is going to happen or has to happen for humanity to continue to exist. Um, until then, we're uh, going to have to do some sort of mechanized uh, cover crop, uh, um, mechanized no-till vegetable production. So Here's a quick video of rolling some cover crop with our cover crop roller. Um, works pretty nice. We did a side by side comparison on the left um, was tillage uh, for um, winter squash and this was going to be no till winter squash. However, we did not have luck this year. Um, this is last year with this uh, method um, for, you know, a couple of reasons. We didn't have a big enough stand and also we didn't, we had a mix of peas and rye and triticale and the triticale and rye killed with the rolling but the peas didn't die and so we had a big mess of peas and weeds. Um, but we're, we tried it again this year, had better luck. Um, we're, we're making advances each year on that but um, you know just trying to reduce the amount of tillage whenever you can and also, this method, you're also keeping your soil covered, which is very, very important to, you know, that's keeping your soil, your um, water in there, so it reduces your irrigation needs, and it's protecting soil from precipitation events that can really beat up um, that top layer of soil and reduce your ability to sequester carbon. Oh, sorry. So here's what it looked like after rolling. Um, again, oh, and there's some biodiversity right up there. Caught a bird in there. Um, and then this is this year's uh, no-till winter squash situation. And we pulled the peas out of the mix, um, just did grain crops, 
for our rolling and we rolled it twice. That seems to have worked a lot better. Um, you can see the little winter squash plants that we planted in there. However, um, the issues we had this year were one, we didn't get these uh, winter, we just planted it with a water wheel transplanter. We didn't um, strip till it or use some sort of special no-till planter. And so um, they didn't quite, the roots didn't really get in there as well um, as they should have. And they were kind of planted on top of a lot of this mess and they didn't have enough soil contact with the roots and so they kind of struggled because of that um, and also we didn't have quite as thick a stand as we would liked on the beds um, and so we had a little we had some more weed pressure than we'd like um, but this uh, this field here was actually this was the second year of not being tilled um, because the previous year, this had been onions. This is the same field just in the fall of the previous year um, where we planted onions in the spring and we had black plastic and weed mat in the rows. Um, these were raised beds um, on black plastic. And so we pulled the black plastic, pulled the weed mat, uh, and we no-till drilled our cover crop. There's a uh, tillage radish in there too, which winter kills, but also um, before winter kills it uh, gets you some aeration in the soil by growing roots deep in and then when the uh, it's daikon radish basically and when the daikons die and, and over the winter they leave these little holes that allow for water uh, better water infiltration that was uh, number two on the principles um, and also better air um, flow into the lower layers of the soil and also keeps it hopefully a little bit fluffier so when we plant into it the following year um, it has some better tilth. And so, you know, we no-till drilled this in the year before, and then you saw here where we rolled it and planted the winter squash. Um, so we're getting better at figuring out a system for that, um, but still not perfect. Um, this was another kind of situation where um, we're also trying to preserve these beds that we, you know, we make them in the first year with a black plastic layer and we do conventional tillage. And then we're trying to keep those beds um, for two or three years afterwards without tilling them. And so after this was sweet potatoes and we harvested our sweet potatoes and then we spread, um, actually no, sorry, first we no-till drilled oats and peas in there and then we spread compost on top of that and then we planted garlic into it. And that worked out really, really well um, this year. And after planting the garlic, we spread leaves over the top. Um, don't have the best picture of the garlic. It's over here on the left. Um, so that we had an excellent crop of garlic, uh, didn't get tilled. And so that was, you know, two crops with one tillage event. Um, and the, you know, the garlic did exceptionally well uh, without being tilled. Um, and then the other beds, this was all sweet potatoes the previous year, we experimented with planting onions into them the following year. So what we did here is we spread um, I planted oats and peas again. So this is what it looked like kind of over the winter and going into the spring. There's winter killed oats and peas. And then we spread uh, a layer of compost over the top of the bed. And then we spread a layer of old leaf mulch. And then we used the water wheel transplanter again to plant the onions right into the bed. Um, and those did really well. And then uh, these other beds on the either side we planted a um, just a cover crop mix that was not winter killing. And so when it got a little taller, we mowed it down with a flail mower and then we came through and we raked um, just by hand, but we could probably also have used a, um, a hay rake and we raked some of this uh, flail mowed cover crop onto the leaves as additional mulch because uh, that's going to provide some nitrogen and some more fertility. Um, also, sorry, more weed control um, and moisture retention. So by, you know, that's kind of like a transferred mulch system where we're just raking this uh, flail chopped cover crop onto the onions. Um, and that worked really well. We had some weeds, uh, not terrible. Um, the onions look great, way better than the onions we planted in our conventionally tilled plot. Um, and so that has some promise. Um, in, in doing a system like that. So that's another way that we're trying to have a more mechanized, um, you know, larger scale system for doing uh, vegetables um, with no tillage.
Um, uh, all, oh, uh, uh, there's a question in the chat. I don't know if you want to take it now or in a minute. Um, it's asking about um, a piece of equipment you were talking about. And there have been a couple of things you've mentioned. I wonder if you want to just pause and talk about um, particular equipment that you've mentioned that people might not be familiar with. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we had the cover crop roller that was, so we got that and we got a no-till drill. Um, I'll skip forward and show you the no-till drill. Sorry, everybody close your eyes or you're gonna ruin the surprises. Uh-oh. Oh. Needs to catch up with me here. Um, yeah, there we go. Uh, so we got that and the cover crop roller with um, a acre grant through Mass Department of Ag. And so this is basically has these cultures on the front that um, cut into the soil and then it plants a seed right in there um, through these disc openers and then the back has a little press on it that presses the soil, the seeds in afterwards to get good seed to soil contact. And so that's what we're using to plant our cover crops without tilling. We've also used this to plant um, radishes uh, for cash crop and I've used it for planting our snap peas as a cash crop. Uh, we're also going to try um, beets and carrots one of these days. I think it will <clears throat> work because there's a smaller seed box on the back for smaller seed, um, whereas this larger seed box in the front is for grains and this one could be used for carrots or beets or radishes. Um, so that's been a great piece of equipment. Um, and then uh, I think maybe the other piece of equipment was the hay rake. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a picture of that, but um, that's a very common piece of equipment uh, that you find that you use during hay production. And it basically, um, it's called a side delivery hay rake and it just kind of rakes up, it's used for raking hay into windrows. And so that's something you could probably drive down this bed with and it would rake all this material kind of into a row right alongside the bed and then you could you'd still have to kind of move it in around the plants by hand but it would uh, remove a lot of manual labor. Um, is there any other pieces of equipment? Well you mentioned something you were using for your compost and I didn't quite catch what that oh. was. Um, so oh, doesn't like the videos. Um, yep so up here in the left corner is a compost turner um, so it's basically like a blender. Um, that's the underside of it. This big blue thing folds down so um, it's along the ground and those um, you know, uh, agitators basically you just run through here and it just mixes up your compost really well. So that mixes air into your compost uh, and it also brings what's inside out and what's outside in so that you get um, a better mix um, and things are more evenly mixed. And that was another piece that we got through a grant um, from MDAR, a um, the ACIP, Agricultural Compost Improvement Program grant. Um, so yeah, MDAR has been um, you know, really great um, for trying to up your, your equipment game. Uh, I highly recommend looking into all the grants they have because um, as a farm, we would never be able to afford these pieces of equipment without them. They are a cost sharing, most of them, where we had to pay 20 to 25% of the cost, um, but you know, that made it affordable for us. Yeah, great, thank you. Thanks for taking those questions. Yeah, no problem. Um, all right, so third uh, principle is increasing your water retention um, and decreasing runoff. So uh, I don't have a whole lot of slides on this, um, sorry, uh, but I can kind of go through what our plans are for it. So. The big thing is uh, keep our children's soils covered because really they're not our soils. We're just borrowing them from future generations. And I think they would greatly appreciate it if we um, took care of them so that they have a way to survive um, in the future. So um, I think that was a uh, Native American um, tenant was to, you know, act like you're um, you know, consider the next seven generations as you make choices and things. So that's, I think, very, even more uh, important now. And I think we kind of need to uh, consider that more. Um, and, you know, what's going to happen seven generations further? Is, are the things I'm doing in life right now, are they things that can continue to be done sustainably for the next seven generations? 
um, I think a lot of the things we do today, the answer would be no. So um, always ask yourself that question. So here uh, we have a mixture of, this was actually oats and peas that we grazed um, our ruminants on and they mashed it down into the ground. Um, and you know, so we also got some, you know, the amount of material that's on the top here, there's an equal amount in the soil right now that's being degraded by microorganisms and hopefully being turned into um, stable carbon uh, by worms and bacteria and fungi and things like that. Um, and also in the meantime, all the stuff on the top is protecting our soil from precipitation events, um, helping to reduce runoff, um, and it's all it's reducing uh, the amount of water that's evaporating during hot, dry, and windy spells. And so, you know, this keeping your soil covered is just so so essential uh, to your soil health. Um, the I was hearing Brian O'Hara describing, um, you know. His, his thinking on keeping the soil covered. And he was talking about how when the soil is broken, you know, when you remove, you till or you remove the soil covering, um, that's like a, a wound in the earth. And then the weeds come in and they're basically a rash. Those weeds, um, you know, that's a rash that the earth is, it's an allergic reaction to us tilling and removing the natural cover um, from the earth. And so, um, you know, that that's, the weeds are just the earth trying to heal and protect itself. Um, and here, you know, we just keep fighting it and trying to, um, you know, don't fight nature, you'll never win. <laughs> It'll be a never ending battle. Um, so the more we can keep the soil covered, uh, the more we're gonna be, uh, you know, working within natural systems and the healthier the soil is gonna be. Um, and so after our ruminants came in and ate all this peas and the oats um, down and it served as food for them, sorry. Um, we were able to, again to come in with our no-till drill and we drilled in um, the sorghum sudan. On the left, those are little sorghum sudan plants coming up. And on the right are um, the sun hemp seedlings coming up. And so, you know, that's, that I can't tell you enough how that, that no-till drill has really been life-changing um, to be able to manage cover crops in this way, to get a new summer cover crop seeded after our spring cover crop has been trampled down by our ruminants. Um, it just, you know, it allowed us to grow in leaps and bounds um, in a regenerative way. And so, you know, that's another instance too where you know, it is mechanization. We're driving across. It takes a pretty big tractor to pull that no-till drill. So we are, um, you know, adding some compaction to our soil. Hopefully a lot of it's being mitigated by the sorghum sudan roots and also by earthworm activity, uh, hopefully re-aerating our soil after it's being packed down by our tractor tires. And also we're burning fossil fuels by um, driving through with the tractor. Um, but the amount of, uh, human power it would take to seed these cover crops in this manner is just, um, it's beyond our labor force uh, that's involved in agriculture right now. So, you know, I do think, you know, this is kind of like a bridge to the future where, um, you know, we have a massive movement of people back to the land and there's enough people per acre where we can go out and we can broadcast um, these seeds into the ground and then maybe you know, we wait right before rain, broadcast the cover crops onto the ground, and then move ruminants over it right afterwards. And those ruminants with their hooves will work the seed into the soil. That's, you know, that's the natural way of doing no-till seeding into areas is the, you know, ruminants will, uh, their hooves push the seeds into the soil. Um, they also kind of aerate it as they make the soil uneven. Um, and that allows those seeds to germinate. So, you know, if you're working on a smaller um, scale in the garden or, you know, even just a smaller acreage um, for, uh, you know, cover cropping or market gardening, you know, you can go out and broadcast these uh, cover crops and then work them in either through, um, you know, just pushing them down to the soil or you know, running over them with your feet and then watering or waiting until it rains out there and running around on them or moving your animals through, um, you know, just somehow you got to get those seeds worked into the soil and get good seed to soil contact. Um, but, you know, on a larger acreage, 
uh, you know, just having five feet people trying to feed, you know, 200 families, uh, it, it, it's pretty hard to do without some of these larger mechanized um, implements. So. Um, another thing we do to try to help increase water retention and reduce runoff um, is by having, you know, here's a good example. We're using fossil fuels to pump uh, water um, through here and water our crops because otherwise we were about ready to lose this winter squash and corn crop because uh, we only got about an inch of rain between late June and um, now. So it's about six weeks. Um, so we're really you know, struggling with the, the water and that seems to be kind of the, the new norm um, in the beginning phases of the climate crisis uh, in our areas. We have this really long drought in July and August um, and so you have to have some sort of way to um, either save all the water you can um, and maybe possibly add some water, uh, especially, you know, like I said earlier with our soils, we have that uh, loamy sand and we just, we have very little water retention. Um, people who have heavier clay soils uh, can, you know, work through it a little bit better, especially with big amounts of mulch, you might be able to work your way through a drought without watering, um, but with our soils and also, we're, we're a little low on organic matter, um, both from previous farming techniques and also uh, just the nature of our sandy soil um, is inherently low in bio uh, soil carbon. Um, you know, we, we have to irrigate to make sure we have a crop and we're able to feed people and um, keep the, our farm economically sustainable. Um, but so we have these strips uh, that we call harvest lanes or biodiversity strips. Uh, in between our crops. So we have a 60 foot wide cash crop section and then we have a 12 foot wide biodiversity section which uh, is kind of pretty dry and looking sad now but in the spring you know we try to let these grow up as tall as we can and there's a lot of insects and birds living in there um, and also when we have big rain events if we have a huge downpour if we do have some runoff running along this tilled area as it hits this biodiversity strip um, that's going to slow it down because this is always covered. You know, we never till this. So that slows down any runoff that's happening. Um, it's also reducing the overall amount of evapotranspiration um, happening where we're losing water up through, you know, the areas that have been tilled and are covered by plant leaves. Um, so, uh, you know, and also there's uh, kind of a, um, a home for our biological, our soil biology to live, um, you know, because when we do some of these areas, we still are doing conventional tillage. And so we eventually till it in the spring, but uh, with any luck, there's the organisms are continuing to live in the soil in the biodiversity strips, and they can slowly start to colonize after the tillage event and come back in from the edges. Um, so, you know, it's nice to have these strips. Um, and then further down here, uh, unfortunately, I don't have a picture, but the, the land starts to get a little bit more sloped and then it goes into a creek. And so we were seeing some erosion um, in the section beyond here. And so we decided to take that section out of vegetable production and we turned it into perennial pasture for our ruminants. And so now we have a good 150 foot buffer between, actually it's probably closer to 250 foot because um, there's a riparian strip beyond that. But, um, you know, there's a good 150 feet of perennial pasture and then there's another 100 feet of riparian, um, you know, trees and shrubs and things before it hits the creek. So any runoff, you know, it's not getting a running start. A lot of times you'll see like a big 200 foot long section along a, you know, hilly area and but the runner, the water is gaining speed as it comes down the hilly area and it's pulling more and more of your soil along as it goes. And so if you can stop it before it reaches the creek, then you're going to hold that soil on your farm um, and thus keep your carbon on your farm and help uh, increase your carbon in your soil. So um, the other thing is, yeah, trying to get that high soil carbon and organic matter as much as possible. We do a lot of compost applications every place that we um, plant with cash crops gets a compost application beforehand. Um, <clears throat> that also helps to inoculate the soil with your soil microorganisms. Uh, and it's, you know, adding, hopefully each year you're adding soil carbon. Um, I should have added as well that uh, rotating these vegetable cash crops with cover crops um, so that they have a rest and then they're, they're not getting tilled every year and they're having some years 
that are actually soil building where um, you know cash crop you're kind of having soil reduction so we have usually one year of um, a cash crop and then we'll no-till drill in uh, grain like wheat that we'll harvest the following year without tilling again and then the year after that we'll um, you know actually so we have the grain we'll frost seed in clover so then after harvesting the grain it becomes a clover cover crop um, that we might graze the following year um, and then the year after that we'll plow it um, for a cash crop again so you know year one is getting plowed in the spring cash crop and then no-till drill grain um, frost seed clover and so the following year it's not getting tilled or um, cropped at all but we are getting some cash crop off it by harvesting the grain and then the year after um, it'll get cash cropped again or if we can afford it in the rotation we'll have an additional year where it's just getting grazed um, and not getting tilled so you know at the most we're tilling every two years ideally we're chilling every three to four years um, and then again obviously this is not what we're doing here but drip irrigation is another really good way to save your water um, you know, it puts the water right where it needs to be. If you can get those drip tapes underground, uh, the more of your water is, is staying in the soil and not, um, you're not losing it through evaporation. Um, and also it's just, it's a better way to save water and get water off into the soil rather than, you know, a lot of this water is hitting the plant leaves and then just evaporating straight from the leaves before even hitting the soil. Um, but, you know, when possible, because it, it's really difficult and it's a lot of plastic to, to try to drip um, these winter squash and the corn um, situations. So, all right, uh, here's probably my favorite um, biodiversity. So, I have a few um, things on biodiversity, but I can't stress that enough. Biodiversity um, is is the best thing you can do, and um, perhaps the funnest and most enjoyable part of regenerative agriculture. Um, so, just walking around the farms, the pictures I took during the year. Uh, we're right on the river, so we have um, a number of big mama snapping turtles that come up every year and lay their eggs in the field. And um, if we ever do see it in a tilled cash crop, we mark it um, and we don't touch that area. We don't cultivate it. We don't till it. Um, that becomes uh, the snapping turtles breeding grounds for the year. And, you know, we're happy to give up you know, a couple hundred square feet a year to make sure that the snapping turtles keep coming back year after year. Um, I can't explain to you, I'm not a, uh, a snapping turtle biologist, so I can't explain all the roles that they perform in the ecosystem, but I can assure you they do perform crucial functions. And so the more snapping turtles or the more turtles you have or reptiles or anything, the better. Uh, whenever you see more biodiversity, that is a good thing to have and it's a good indicator that things are moving in the right direction or at least staying in the right direction on your farm. Um, this, is, uh, this is how well they blend in. You kind of got to look closely but right here we this is a killdeer nest. Um, they just laid it in our where we're cutting our wood pile for our firewood um, you know, just right there on the ground. This is the you know, we've seen a couple killdeers here and there in the past, but this year they really seem to have exploded. We just saw uh, killdeer nests everywhere and baby killdeers. Um, I wish I had the video, but the, you know, these killdeers, eventually they woke, they, you know, started roaming around the nest and they're hopping around, following mom around the market garden. It was the cutest thing. Um, so, you know, I think more birds, more biodiversity, that's a really good sign. Uh, you know, somewhere, I think it was in, um, the biggest little farm, they said that the year seven of regenerative when you start to see come into bed and, um, you know, your biodiversity really start to increase. And we've definitely seen this uh, uh, this year. Um, our, the number, the bird population has just gone through the roof. Um, we have, you know, we had some starlings starting off, but this year it's like an Alfred Hitchcock movie with the amount of starlings we have. They're just like everywhere. Like I tried to count one of the flocks once and there was like easily three or 400 starlings just moving around the farm, like flying up in the trees and flying through the, um, you know, the swampy area. And they're just, they've just exploded. There's starlings everywhere. You know, there's starling nests in the chicken coop. There's starling nests um, in our cabin. There's starling nests, you know, in our tractor shed, just everywhere you look, there's starlings, baby starlings, starling nests in the barn. 
um, they're just totally taking over the farm, um, which again, I think that is a great thing. Although you do have to, uh, there are some food safety issues that you have to consider, but um, you know, I think it's a good thing and we can handle the food safety issues um, without getting rid of the starlings. Um, here's a baby robin nest uh, on the wood pile that was right next to the killdeer nest. So, um, you know, this is just right in the middle of the farmyard where we're all hanging out, going back and forth. And, um, you know, this is just to show how, how many there are. If there's, you know, this many just that you pretty much trip over as you're walking around the farm, then imagine how many are in better hidden spots. Um, so, you know, we've seen a lot of robins this year, um, you know, a lot of starlings, killdeers, red-winged blackbirds. Our hawk population has gone through the roof. Um, um, yeah, hummingbirds, yeah, we've seen a lot, a lot of hummingbirds. Um, they love the country, they love, we have a pollinator section up front of the farm and we just see tons of hummingbirds up there, all sorts of insects. Um, yeah, it's really just amazing the amount of biodiversity <coughs> uh, we're seeing now. Um, here is where our hay field that we cut um, our hay, some hay and straw from, and this big patch in the middle that we avoided, that was all, um, uh, sorry, I'm blanking here for a minute. Um, uh, oh, milkweed, sorry, uh, it's milkweed um, that, you know, because there is, you know, I'm reading about a large decline in monarch butterflies, and I've even seen it myself. When I was a kid, I remember seeing, anytime you see milkweed, you see a bunch of monarchs flying around it. Um, now we have this huge patch of milkweed and only a couple, you know, I saw maybe one or two monarchs. Um, so anytime we see a patch of milkweed, you know, I'm happy to, it's a little more pain in the neck to drive around it with a tractor and, um, you know, we're losing some hay. But again, um, you know, it's not about us, it's about the next seven generations. And so if, you know, I have to take a little bit of extra time to drive around this, um, that means that there's monarch butterflies for the next seven generations, I'm happy to do it. Um, so, you know, just little things like that. And this is uh, where our river goes around right behind this tree line, the Taunton River, oh, sorry, runs through there. Um, and the previous farmer, the cows were going right up to the river because that's where they're getting their water. Um, and we decided to try to get this riparian buffer going again, where we have a good 30 feet of buffer um, between where we're haying and where the river is. And again, the birds are just loving it, the insects. Um, plus, you know, we're getting a lot of elderberry uh, plants or elder plants uh, growing through here. And so we are getting some cash crop off it because we harvest the elder berries and we turn it into elder syrup um, and we charge a lot of money for it. Um, and hopefully that's helping to pay for <laughs> Uh, riparian um, establishment here. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think that's just any, anywhere you have a river or a wetland, you need to have this big, um, this big riparian area because that's, that's a specific habitat um, that isn't found in other places. And it's just essential. If we're farming right up to the edge of the river, um, you know, you think there's an incredible amount of species. You know, they talk about the edge species are the uh, most important species in ecology and, and this is where they live, these edge habitats between river and meadowland. Um, it's so, so important. Uh, we have a number of herons, great blue herons that live on the, the river um, and are hunting and we see a lot of those. Um, again, great, great signs. Um, <clears throat> here in our greenhouse, we have fungi. Don't forget about them. That's <clears throat> maybe the most important uh, in your our soil ecosystem or really in our farm ecosystem. Um, so this is growing in our greenhouse. I did not identify these, but they, I'm sure they're doing some essential function, breaking things down, providing nutrients, uh, performing, uh, you know, making a heavy relationship with these tomato plants and exchanging sugars um, and carbohydrates from the tomato plant for nutrients and possibly water. Um, so very important. Uh, this is a, um, not actually a fungus, uh, I, you know, I, I, they changed classifications on me since I took uh, mycology, but uh, it's called dog vomit is one name for it, um, uh, or also um, slime mold, sorry, yeah, that's what it was, uh, they call it slime mold, um, I believe it's now like its own thing, kind of in between bacteria and fungi, <clears throat> but you have to ask a, uh, um, a more uh, up-to-date evolutionary biologist on where it's classified, but uh, it's more, you know, it's biodiversity um, in the greenhouse. This is something that we only started seeing in the last year or two. 
when we started doing a no-till production in our greenhouse and adding a lot of carbon, uh, these just partially broken down leaves and a lot of compost. Um, and again, I think this is a really great sign. Um, uh, more biodiversity, chickens in our greenhouse, uh, breaking down and making use of these crops um, and in turn dropping their fertility down, getting rid of uh, hopefully the bad bugs that are in there that could potentially be an issue, like if we have aphids in there before we turn this over to summer crops. Uh, the chick will turn the chickens in if we can and they'll get rid of aphids and give us some fertility and get rid of the um, green material so it's easier to do a no-till crop um, in there you know the less green material when you're transitioning to a crop the better. Um, more biodiversity pigs in the forest and a whole mess of piglets in there. Um, you know we probably overgrazed this forest a little bit but then we didn't put the pigs in there for another six years so um, you know, if you do overgraze an area, I think, you know, over, um, let it over rest later on. So um, now we're seeing a lot of different species come up in this area where, um, you know, we haven't had pigs there for a while. Um, more biodiversity. So here's uh, sheep and you see a lot of different um, uh, species in our cover crop mix. And if you listen, you can hear a lot of insects and birds as well. Um, again, very, very important. Uh, oh, sorry, and this one actually has even better, you can visually see the insects and the birds and you can hear them a little bit better. Uh, this is where we're moving our cows into one of our back pastures. Again, I can't stress how important this is, these trees and having, you know, a lot of forest. You should have, definitely have more forest than meadowland um, in a in a thriving farm ecosystem uh, and regenerative farm, they're performing essential functions. And um, so you can see all the insects flying around in front of the screen. And if I shut up, you can hear the birds. Oh, one is late to the party as always. Um, but, you know, you can really see, like, just look at all those insects flying around in front of the, the camera there. It's just, um, you know, it's incredible the amount of insects we have. Um, the further you get from our tilled and cash vegetable crop area, the more insects we have. This field back here is just absolutely loaded with insects. Um, and, you know, the more habitat you have, we have this nice tall grass that really increases the habitat for the insects, um, you know, because they're not, so you, it's not just a linear habitat they have, but it's also a vertical or not just a horizontal habitat, but, you know, they're living in the grasses. So the taller the grass is, the, the, the greater the habitat for the insects. Um, and over here too, we have this kind of like section in the middle um, that we're, oops, sorry, that we're trying to increase on the farm and get that, um, get some more, uh, more, shrubs and trees to grow in that area um, whereas you know previously this entire field had been uh, monocropped um, it was corn when we had moved here um, all right so and then more biodiversity you got your pigs um, you know they perform essential functions too eating the grass um, and you know doing some tillage uh, i'll get to that a little bit later we try to do tillage with our pigs um, and then, sorry, this is a really short one, but this here is kale that had overwintered the previous year. Um, and we were supposed to graze the cows on it. They were scheduled to graze. Um, and then I went up there and looked at these kale flowers uh, and the amount of bees and insects and pollinators that were in this kale crop was just phenomenal. And I, I just, I, it was just incredible. And I could not bring myself to bring put the cows on it. So we kind of changed our rotational plan, moved the cows onto a different pasture instead, um, because it was just, you know, it, it was just so important to keep those pollinators and keep the bees happy that, um, you know, it's no problem to change our rotation a little bit. Yeah, it means we're not gonna, um, you know, we get ran a little bit short on pasture later on, but, you know, we figured it out because this is, this is very important to keep those bees happy. Um, so, yeah. It's, a very short video. I, I should have taken a longer video, but what I was trying to do is get a picture of that bee on the flower, but um, pictures didn't come out so well in the video. Should have just done the video, but there's just 
incredible amount of bees. And, you know, if you really look closely too, you'd, I could count at least five or six different species of um, bees in there. Um, or, you know, yeah, I think bees and for some of them might've been wasps, but uh, I'm not a uh, entomologist, uh, but they, um, they're there. And the more you see, the better. And the more you can, um, you know, help out with their habitat and increase their habitat, the better. So, um, so here we have a Rudolf Steiner quote. Um, and this is another fungi that I saw growing up. It's a little bleach, sorry for the photo, but at the base of this 100 year old, 100 year old oak tree we have out in our pasture, we saw this big um, sort of fungi come along. Um, and again, I'm not sure what kind it is, but I hadn't seen it there before. And I'm sure it is a good sign though that it's growing up there. So uh, Steiner said, um, in German of course, the correct balance of woods, orchards, bushes, and meadows with their natural growth of fungi is so essential to good farming that your farm will really be more successful even if this means slight reduction in your tillable acreage. There is no true economy in using so much of your land that all the things I've mentioned disappear. And I really can't stress that enough. Um, and here he was talking about how important fungi was um, back in 1917, I believe. Um, and it's a hundred years later before, you know, the university and the academics are catching up with it. And they're finally starting to realize that, oh, wow, fungi is really important. And they can um, form relationships with plants to trade nutrients and water for carbohydrates. And, um, you know, it is important to have these meadowlands and these, um, you know, trees surrounding your farm and, um, hedgerows and things like that. Um, we're just starting to understand how important it was. And here Rudolf Steiner was a hundred years ago trying to tell us that, um, you know, don't do the, don't plow fence row to fence row as Earl Butts uh, encouraged us back in the seventies. Um, that, that was terrible advice. And um, I had only wished that uh, he had read Rudolf Steiner. We might be in a different place today. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's so, so important. And hopefully um, now people are starting to realize that again. All right, so carbon sequestration. I'll try to run through this fairly quickly. So we leave, have some time for questions at the end. Um, but, uh, you know, some of the things we do to try to increase our carbon sequestration, here's our greenhouse. We put in, you know, we had chickens in here and we also put a lot of leaves. Um, and again, these are coming from local landscapers. So, we're actually maybe possibly saving fossil fuels because they're not having to drive as far to drop them off. You know, our farm is closer than where they're dropping off normally and that's where they drop off. You know, if it was further, they wouldn't drop off because, um, you know, they're all about time and money. Um, and so uh, we know but that by getting these leaves, we're actually reducing the amount of fossil fuels that the landscapers are using. Um, and then it's becoming part of it's, you know, being sequestered into our soil as those fungi that we saw earlier and the slime molds are breaking it down and forming it into stable carbon. Um, and, you know, we're up to about 10% organic matter in this uh, greenhouse now, whereas when we moved there, it was about 2.4%. So we've quadrupled the amount of carbon that we put into, that we have in the soil here. Um, here's a close up of what that um, soil looks like under the leaves. Again, you know, there's a lot of things going on. See a little bit of mycelium there. Um, you see some, I believe these are maybe just dead plant root there, but I think that's also mycelium. Um, you know, if, if I had a video uh, and a closer shot, you'd see lots of little tiny insects um, crawling around in there. And, you know, that's a good healthy soil um, compared to uh, where we haven't done this, like outside the greenhouse, there's some areas that, that look like, you know, a beach on Cape Cod. They're just sand and, you know, barely any life on them. Um, and this is what we've been able to turn into them by turn them into by adding compost and organic matter and biodiversity. Um, you know, no-till cover crops, trying to reduce or eliminate tillage in your cover crop rotation really helps. There's a no-till cover crop drill. Um, and this was winter squash that we harvested and then we just mowed it and then now we're just planting cover crops. So before we had this, before we had this no-till drill, we would have to mow it disc it, uh, spread the cover crop, and then disc it again. Um, so that's two tillage passes we eliminated and 
to um, driving over with the tractor that we eliminated. So um, less fossil fuels, less compaction, more carbon. Uh, here's grazing uh, cows on cover crop oats and peas that we no-till drilled. Um, and you know they're just stamping it down as we saw earlier where we were seeding the sorghum sedan and the sun hemp. Um, you know they stamp it down into that. Uh, you know that's what it looks like later. And you know the amount of carbon we have above the soil is hopefully the same amount of carbon below the soil that's being sequestered. Uh, even though you know they eat this up and they turn it into nice little um, nutrient patties for us. And a lot of that also will get into the soil, you know, the more dung beetles you have, um, the more that will get incorporated into the soil, um, or if they'll later become nutrients for more cover crops that will become carbon uh, that will sequester into the soil. So, you know, like we said earlier, it's about utilizing and leveraging photosynthesis to produce carbon, uh, so you can get that carbon in your soil. So um, the more crops we can get, the bigger we can get them, the more nutrient, you know, the more nutrients we can get in them, um, the more carbon they're gonna produce, and the more carbon we'll be able to get into our soil. Um, here's them again, grazing on the sorghum sedan grass. Um, you know, again, I can't stress enough to the, having that rotational grazing um, really sequesters carbon. Um, and I have some data to prove it. This is the sorghum sedan. This is like five weeks after planting it. Um, it that stuff gets crazy big. There's some sun hemp in there too, but it kind of got shaded out a little bit by the sorghum sedan. We have to adjust our seeding rate right there. There's a sun hemp, um, but you know, just incredible amount of biomass. And again, you're thinking there's that much below the soil. Plus some of this is going to get incorporated into the soil as well um, when we either graze it or um, yeah, usually we're, we're grazing it to get into the soil. Um, Again, that picture of the earthworms, um, you know, you see all those little piles of worm castings and um, then the cover crop is coming back up. Yeah, the one thing I didn't mention too is the pigs didn't eat all the cover crop and so some of it was left and it was enough to reseed itself. And so we came back with a no-till drill and we kind of hit these little patches that got a little more wear and tear from the pigs to seed them, but most of it was looking like this afterwards and we didn't have to seed it. Um, so that was like a whole year of growing cover crops uh, without having to till the soil at all other than what the pigs did. Um, and I think that really increased the carbon in the soil there. Um, so multi-species rotational grazing, you know, the more species you can get in there, the better. Um, we have uh, goats and sheep in this. We have grazed sheep and cows together. Um, but kind of for management issues, we've switched to, you know, we'll graze sheep and then we'll graze cows um, at a later date or vice versa. But the more species you have doing the grazing, the better they're going to increase the, uh, your pasture uh, biodiversity by encouraging different plant species because each um, type of ruminant, each class of ruminant likes a different plant species. And so you're going to get better biodiversity by having more biodiversity uh, grazing it. Um, and also you're getting different types of uh, manure that have different nutrient contents. And I, I'm sure, you know, I don't have any proof for this, but I'm sure you're getting different um, types of microorganisms that are in the guts of each of these animals. And then, so you're going to have uh, increasing your microbiological biodiversity by having different types of ruminants. Um, and so real quick, here is the proof of why rotational grazing um, increases your soil carbon better than any sort of no-till crop production. Um, so what you're trying to go for is uh, uh, and Andre Voisin um, was kind of the, um, the first person to really scientifically look at grass growth and forage growth um, and their growth curves. And so here's your growth curve of forages. Uh, it starts off really, really slow and then it's really, really fast for phase two. And then once they reach this size, they kind of slow down and don't do much growth. So if you're grazing it right here, each time you're setting it back to here and you're getting this big growth phase and then you graze it and then it gets down to here in a big growth phase. Whereas if you just leave it, um, you know, the growth is slowing down and it's slowing down and you're not getting as much growth. So with the proper management, um, you, you, you keep in, get it, you know, trying to encourage these big growth phases um, where they're where rapidly growing your forage cr crops and you're going to get a lot more carbon in your soil because if you remember, you know, you're beating into your heads here that the, you know, every, the more and more forage and uh, biomass above the soil is the same amount of biomass below the soil. So every time 
grows up like this, you're having an equal amount of um, roots in the bottom. Your ruminants come along, graze it off. And then when the plants go back down to this size after grazing, all, they don't need all those roots anymore. The amount of roots they had when they were this tall, those roots are still down there, but they don't need them as much because the plant's only that tall. And so those roots start to die off and they become carbon in your soil. Um, and that's where they're sequestered. So this is where, um, and this is how rotational grazing uh, is the best way to sequester carbon into your soil. Um, and here is the, the, the proof in the pudding here. Um, the actual scientific data, VRG is uh, Voisin uh, Rational Grazing, NT is no-till. Um, and so these folks, these kind academics have gone out and measured all these things and they've shown us that you're getting a lot more soil organic carbon um, into your soil through the Voisin method uh, compared to even no-till um, you know, vegetable production or, or crop production. So you know, normal conventional is probably way down here. Um, so, you know, even with no-till, you're still not getting the same amount of soil carbon, um, you know, soil organic carbon in your soil compared to uh, voice and method. So, you know, you're getting it in the, the top layer and the bottom layer. So, you know, I really think, you know, the more land you have in that rotational grazing, the better. Obviously, we can't all eat meat all the time. It's probably not the best thing for us. So, um, you know, vegetable production does need to happen. But no-till, you know, if you're using the, the um, manure from these animals composted to feed your small no-till vegetable prop, uh, crops, you know, that's great. And the small, you know, we have like three acres of vegetable crops and we have 30 acres of um, rotational grazing areas and pasture. So, you know, I think that's a pretty good um, ratio. And um, yeah, so basically the less uh, crops and, and vegetable crops you have compared to the amount of rotational grazing you're having, uh, the more soil carbon you're going to get. Um, so that's it. That's my name and my farm, our farm, and email if you need to contact us. We also have a website. Um, and I'm going to work. Hopefully this winter, one of my projects is to get a lot of this uh, regenerative and no-till information on the website because we'd like to have it um, be a resource because um, there's not that many resources out there right now um, for no-till and regenerative farming, especially in our area because, you know, it really, uh, this type of farming, it, it, it's regional specific. So what works um, in Massachusetts isn't necessarily going to work in Pennsylvania, vice versa, especially not going to work in, you know, uh, Africa or other countries. So um, you really have to, you know, the more resources, regional specific resources we have, the better. So hopefully, uh, check back over the winter and the spring and we'll have some more of this information posted up on the website and we'll continue to update it as we learn more. Um, so great. yeah, great to hand it over to any questions or comments that people have. Uh, thanks again for attending and um, yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Chuck. That was really a fascinating talk and you, you, you put a lot into one brief presentation that really uh, was amazing. <laughs> um, I love the way you're thinking out of the box and looking for resources in all different directions, you know, looking to local uh, breweries to nitrogen into your compost. I mean, it's really a lot of um, sort of ideas that involve a lot of creativity and resourcefulness. Um, so that was really inspiring. Um, I have several questions, but I, there are already a few in the chat and um, I imagine other people have questions as well. Um, so I think I'll jump to the chat first um, and just uh, go back to a few questions. Um, one question that came up after we were talking about um, the equipment, um, somebody wanted to know what the compost piece was called. Uh, so it's called a compost turner. Um, yeah, a compost windrow turner. Okay, great. Everybody can go Google that. <laughs> Um, and then I think related right after that, um, somebody asked, can you sow oats and peas without that special equipment? Yes, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I, I touched on that a little bit. So on a smaller scale, you can go out there and just broadcast your oats and peas right over the surface. Um, but then you're gonna have to either, you have to incorporate it or cover it up somehow. So you can either um, broadcast them right before a heavy rainstorm and then get out there with some sort of animal or person, I guess we are animals, um, and trample it in really well. Um, you know, bare feet run through the, 
run through there really heavily or kids. If you've got a lot of kids, you can turn them out on the pasture and have them work the O's and P's into the soil. Um, it could be a fun game for the neighborhood. Um, or you can spread mulch over the top um, and that would uh, you know, protect uh, the O's and P's and have the moisture level where they are in the soil enough so that they um, would germinate. Or you know, also if you can roll them into the soil like you know, I've seen like people just have a 50 gallon barrel full of water and you roll that over the oats and peas after broadcasting them. Um, and that would work them into the soil, hopefully enough to germinate them. But yeah, doing it uh, right before a full moon and right before rain uh, is ideal. Yeah, okay, great, thank you. Um, and then right after that, you had a picture that had some corn and then it had some squash and then there was um, a strip before you got to the next patch of squash. And somebody posted a question that said, uh, what's growing in biodiversity strip? It looks like grass. Do you mow it to keep it from going to seed? Yeah, so the biodiversity stretch strip is uh, basically just the same pasture mix that we have um, in our pastures. So there's a mix of different types of grasses. Um, there's like, we have a lot of orchard grass, brome grass, um, some white clover, red clover, um, and then you're just some other lesser amounts of other pasture species. Um, we pretty much just let whatever grows there grow there. Um, and we, we try not, we try to mow it as little as possible. So if there's just a cover crop in the sections next to it, we won't mow it at all because, um, you know, the more, the taller it is, the more habitat there is for insects. Um, and also it kind of serves as a windbreak. Um, and also once in a while, if you can let all those things go to seed, then you'll increase um, your biodiversity and also the density of those strips. Um, so that's good. But when we have a cash crop in there, um, we kind of, we will mow it mostly just to, so it's not shading our crops and increasing, you know, you kind of have more fungal issues if you have a lot of shading and not enough airflow. Um, so sometimes we'll mow it, um, but we're not too worried about the seeds, um, you know, because there's nothing in there that becomes weeds. You know, they're mostly like brome grass and Orchard grass, they don't typically become a weed in the cash crop for us. Um, they just grow so slowly that uh, we're not too worried about the, the seed issue. Yeah, okay, great. Um, I have a question about your uh, rotational grazing situation. Um, I was trying to get a sense of, like, are your cattle at some point on every field in your farm? And if so, how do you deal with the fencing? It seems like that could be a, a big logistical piece um, in terms of covering that much space? You know, is it permanent? Is it movable? Um, how are you dealing with that? Um, so yeah, it's all movable. It's definitely, that is uh, a huge thing. That's, I spent a lot of time. Um, and if I had to pay myself for my time, then uh, I wouldn't be able to do it or I would be charging $30 a pound for our ground beef. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, it, it, that's a huge headache. Um, again, I'm waiting for that massive movement of people back on the farm to uh, help out with that. But in the meantime, um, the cows are just a single strand of electric fence. Um, and what we do is we set them all up in the spring. We set, um, we have about 50 two thirds of an acre paddocks on the farm and we set them up in the spring when we have more time. And then those are pretty much set up for the rest of the season. And so we just have to move the cows from one section to the next. Uh, and the sheep, we do a three strand. Um, and so yeah, the cows are pretty much move over all sections. Sheep move over most of the sections, um, and it's kind of the same fence, but we just add two more strands of electric, uh, and that seems to keep them in. But yeah, that, that's a huge, huge labor intensive thing. Um, and it, I can highly recommend that you, you got to figure out a system where you can have those fences set up. You can't be taking fence down and setting it up every yeah. day. You'll go mad. We did that for our first five years, and, and it was crazy. Yeah, yeah, it's just a lot, a lot to juggle. But that's really clever to at least get it out of the way in the spring. That's at least one step in the right direction. <laughs> yeah. yeah, great. Um, so we have a question from Rebecca, who is, is an apprentice, um, thinking about the future, I guess, um, and wondering how you got your start in farming. And I know that's probably a huge question, and we only have a couple minutes, but um, if you just want to give a, a quick summary, that would be great. Sure, yeah. So. Um, I always say that I, uh, so I went in at, to UMass Amherst for chemistry and biochemistry and I wanted to get into pharmaceuticals for some reason because I thought I'd uh, make enough money where I could retire to a farm someday because, um, you know, I did some gardening when I was a kid 
And then I, after two years of that, I was like, I hate being in a lab. These fluorescent lights are sucking the life out of me. Um, and my, I switched to plant, soil, and insect science just because I was like, oh, I like plants. And maybe, you know, I'd never even considered farming as a career because I grew up in suburbia. And um, when I took the career placement test, farming was not an option on the career placement tests um, in my high school. So, um, you know, I thought you had to be born into it or um, make enough money in pharmaceuticals that you could buy a farm. Um, and then I took this class with John Gerber uh, at UMass Amherst. Um, he's a great guy, phenomenal guy. The things we did is went and visited a, um, a farm where there's a farmer who was like 25, 26, um, and he was renting farmland. Um, and as soon as I saw that, like I instantly realized that that's what I wanted to do my whole life is farm and it's possible to do it right out of college. You can rent land. Um, it's kind of funny thinking back, the guy was like all depressed because it was like the worst farming season he'd ever had and he wasn't making any money. And he was like, you know, just really down the dumps about it. But I was like, oh my God, this is awesome. Like the guy's doing it. And I, you know, I didn't even think about the, you know, the, the consequences later, the economic consequences, but um, it's not all about economics, right? So. Yeah, then from then on, it was just like farming. That's what I'm doing. You know, I finished the um, UMass Amherst and plant soil, took as many ag courses as I could. Uh, and then I worked at Red Fire Farm um, out in Western Mass for three years after college, just, you know, picking Ryan's brain as much as I could, asking him questions until he was sick of listening to me. And then um, after that, I was like, you know, I'm going to do this on my own. And I went and started looking for land to lease. And um, yeah, at least farm in Vermont and then leased a farm in Rhode Island and eventually now leasing a farm in Mass and hopefully one day we'll own a farm. <laughs> Great. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, yeah, John Gerber was on my senior thesis committee. He's a oh, great awesome. guy. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate all the um, experience you've shared with us.